Whenever this robe hath fulfilled its purpose, the Almighty will assuredly renew it. For every age requireth a fresh measure of the light of God. Every divine revelation hath been sent down in a manner that befitteth the circumstances of the age in which it hath appeared. That the diverse communi communi communities of the earth and the manifold systems of religious belief should never be allowed to foster the feelings of animosity among men is in this day of the essence of the faith of God and his religion. These principles and laws, these firmly established and mighty systems have proceeded from one source and are rays of one light. That they differ one from another is to be attributed to the varying requirements of the ages in which they were promulgated. Baha'u'llah. So today, we're really happy to have Dr. Robert Stockman, and he'll be talking about progressive revelation and the advancement of human knowledge. Dr. Stockman obtained his master's degree and doctorate in religious studies from Harvard University, where he specialized in history of religion in the United States. He's the author of The Baha'i Faith in America, Volumes 1 and 2, which cover Baha'i events in the United States from 1892 to 1900 and 1901 to 1912, respectively. Thornton Chase, the first American Baha'i, Abdul Baha in America, a volume that reviews Abdul Baha's eight month journey across North America, The Baha'i Faith, A Guide for the Perplexed, which is an introductory text, a book about the Baha'i faith and nonviolence, and various articles on Baha'i history and theology. He also edited The World of the Baha'i Faith, a 51 chapter survey of the faith published by Rootledge. He was the director of the Wilmette Institute from 2000 to 2022 and has served on the boards of World Order Magazine and the Baha'i Encyclopedia Project. He's an instructor of religious studies at Indiana University, South Bend. So with that, I'm happy to hand it off to Dr. Stockman. Thank you very much, Paymane. It's nice to see everybody today and um, have a chance to sort of interact with you. I hope I can give you some ideas that will be worth uh, a good discussion afterwards. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, the topic uh, I had originally put down as progressive revelation and the advancement of technology, but I think it's really broader than just technology. It's really the advancement of human knowledge. I've given various, various versions of this talk, I think two or three times now, and each time it gets a little different and gets a little better. So I, I think, uh, I think uh, this is a, probably a better version. Um, I, I should say a little something about um, why we need progressive revelation, why humanity needs progressive revelation. We just heard this marvelous talk, passage uh, that Paimane read from Baha'u'llah about how the religions are all suited for the ages in which they uh, appeared. Uh, and, and that itself is an explanation, I think, for why we need progressive revelation, because the ages keep changing, the situations that humanity uh, faces change, and as they do, we need additional guidance for sort of how to function, what to do. And um, I think probably the, the current situation, at least in North America, with the different religious communities highlights this quite well. When you consider the enormous, uh, I guess I'll say diversity of opinions within Christianity about how North American society uh, should be uh, reorganized, how it should advance, <laughs> with so many different ideas and theories for what would work best for uh, all of humanity uh, you know, on this particular continent. Uh, a book was produced uh, about this uh, in 1896, a, a book by a Christian minister called In His Steps. And I think this book kind of illustrates the problem. 1896, it came out. This was the progressive era when people were worrying about minimum wage and um, people were working 60 or 80 hours a week. And of course there was child labor and there was no uh, sanitary or um, worker safety uh, standards and all kinds of, no fire codes that were enforced in some cases even. Uh, and so the minister who wrote this book uh, postulates a small town in Wisconsin where uh, the local minister asks everybody to please, before they make any moral decision, ask themselves, what would Jesus do? Uh, and so everybody in town is thinking about this. And uh, one lady, one woman is in uh, the, the, the rectangle, which is the slum, and she sees this 
drunk woman come out of uh, a uh, a bar and and fall down. So she takes the lady back to her house to help her sort of straighten herself out and uh, uh, you know move forward. And uh, the 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 author I'll, I'll get to the author in a minute. His name is Charles Sheldon. Uh, if you're curious about that. But uh, so they and the the man who runs the paper decides to start paying a fair wage to his workers and stop accepting ads for liquor, even though his paper might go out of business. And so you have these kinds of changes that people are making as they think about what would Jesus do, you know, and the story works out, you know, that that it really makes a big change in people's lives. But it's quite interesting to note that not only is everyone in the town white, everybody mentioned in the in the book has English first and last names, you know, Clark, Maxwell. Uh, there's no ethnic diversity. There's no racial diversity. The author doesn't even, I think, dare imagine what would happen if that woman who came out of the bar and fell down drunk was black. You know, would the person have brought her into the house under those circumstances? And so the, I think this lim shows you the limitation of the imagination. <clears throat> what would Jesus do? And certainly today, uh, Southern Baptists, liberal Episcopalians, and active Catholics would all have very different answers for what Jesus would do uh, for a variety of issues, just starting with abortion. But beyond that, you can probably name several hundred, if not several thousand different moral issues that people would have very different views on. So that shows you the difficulty with a particular religion that in this case is 2000 years old and was not developed with the, the current problems and needs of our society. Um, and so I, I wanna say a little something about sort of how hum, human needs have changed over time, how society has advanced, and therefore some of the, the needs for changes. And for that, I'll, I'll, I'll show my PowerPoint. <clears throat> Moving on down here, um, oh, it didn't work over there. Why don't, what do I do to make it to change here? There we go. So I talked a little bit about sort of why we need uh, progressive revelation uh, uh, just now, but this example of uh, in his steps and and the the problem of of taking an existing religion and and try to figure out what to do with a, a really a different a different society and a and a world that that didn't exist two thousand years ago. Um, human human beings have of course been advancing now for ever since the first human beings could be described as human beings on the earth. Uh, I, the image I have in my mind of something that perhaps our ancestors could do two or three million years ago is something that I heard about chimpanzees, that when they were up in a tree and they need water and they find a, uh, a spot in the tree where there's a little bit of a hollow with water in it and they can't get the water out with their hands or by sipping it directly, they'll take some leaves, chew the leaves to make a sponge stick the leaves into the hole to pull the water out and then suck the water off the leaves. So there you have someone who's actually making a tool, you see, a very simple tool. And that's something that not just humans make, but other species make as well. But obviously the tools are pretty limited. Uh, we went from being able to do that to being able to uh, make stone tools and of course, um, you know, control fire and all these other kinds of things. And that launched us on this very, very long um, period of time whereby our technology slowly developed. The tools got a little better and, and uh, our um, ability to make clothing became better and, and these kinds of things. Uh, so it's very hard to talk about that period of time, but certainly uh, when you get to the last, say, 10 or 15,000 years of human development, when things really speed up, that's when we really uh, start seeing some of these really interesting changes and the need for, for more uh, revelation and guidance. Uh, material knowledge, is the accumulation of material knowledge really is quite a wide variety of different kinds of things. Uh, I mentioned discovering fire, but I have another, other lists here that are important. Domesticating animals, inventing indoor plumbing, and alphabetization of records just are a few random examples of things that people had to do. Somewhere I read somewhere that the Romans did not have alphabetization of their records. Can you imagine how you run a bureaucracy without that? Uh, and, and it just shows you how something as simple as that. Um, the Roman cavalry didn't have stirrups. Um, it ma makes it much harder to fight a war when you can't anchor yourself to the horse, you know, swinging your sword around. Um, Roman 
uh, wagons didn't have brakes. So when the wagon went downhill, the poor horse had to be the brake uh, to control it. So little things like that, you know, which we take for granted, really make a big difference. And the a, a continuous accumulation of these little um, inventions and discoveries really bring about quite a rapid advancement in, in, in human society. Of course, the, the big breakthrough, <clears throat> in a sense, was the agricultural revolution <clears throat> 10 or so thousand years ago. Now, where do we get this um, this material knowledge? Obviously, sometimes it's just simply individual observation. People see something. <clears throat> excuse me here. <clears throat> People see something. They get curious. They do a little exploration, and they discover how to use it in 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 a new way, or they discover how to control something uh, in a new way. And these things accumulate. Uh, over generations. But in addition to the individual's uh, discoveries, Baha'u'llah also mentions two other things. One is that the uh, people who've passed on to the next world, who are particularly the ones who are pure in spirit, they're able to inspire us. So there's also that kind of inspiration from the next world. And there's also the inspiration from the Holy Spirit that is going on. We can't actually measure these other kinds of spiritual inspiration. We can certainly, um, you know, when we patent something, identify who invented it and, and sort of how, um, but there are these other sources to keep in mind as well. So I want to make, be sure we understand that as well. <clears throat> Give you a little bit of a sense of sort of how much human beings have changed and evolved just in the last, well, 10 or 15,000 years. The picture over here is kind of fuzzy. You might not be able to read it, but the, the, the details are also over in the list on the right. Of course, um, hunting and gathering societies were the societies that dominated the world until approximately 10 to 12,000 years ago in the Middle East when various crops began to be domesticated. In other parts of the world, other things were domesticated at different times. Believe it or not, the second oldest agricultural revolution seems to be the New Guinea highlands when they began to domesticate taro root and various other things. Um, but of course, there's actually about six or different seven places in the world where there were agricultural um, breakthroughs. Uh, in the Americas, you have uh, Mexico, Peru, and probably somewhere in Central North America where there were um, crops that were domesticated. In Africa, somewhere around Cameroon and Nigeria, China um, and Japan were also, uh, China and India were also places where there were breakthroughs. So there are quite a few of these different places, but uh, gradually human beings switched over from hunting and gathering to agriculture. And the population, of course, then began to increase. They estimate the world had maybe 5 million people in it uh, before the uh, advent of, of the agricultural revolution. And once that happened, the population began to climb quite quickly. I've seen numbers, and I think uh, the number I've seen is that the, by the time you get to Abraham, there are 50 million people. By the time you get to Jesus, is around 300 million people. Uh, when you get to the time of, of um, you know, Columbus and uh, about the year 1500, you half a billion. You get a billion in the 1830s, if I remember right. Uh, Two billion about the time my mother was born in the early 20th century. Three billion when I was born, roughly in the 1950s. And of course, today we're up to about eight billion. So the population has been steadily increasing. Interestingly enough, when agriculture was invented, the average height of people decreased and their uh, disease situation increased as well because they went from eating a wide variety of things to eating only a few things that they could raise. Uh, so their, their diet actually deteriorated and their health, their longevity actually shrank, interestingly enough, as well. Hunting and gathering peoples often live 60 or 70 years, but life was really lousy. Um, if you get to, uh, let's say, five or 6,000 years ago uh, in, in uh, agricultural societies. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that in a minute. For agriculture, people have divided it up into simple horticultural, advanced horticultural, and agrarian. Um, and the differences between these have to do with, you know, you're using digging sticks in simple horticultural. When you get to advanced horticultural, you're using hoes uh, and these kinds of things. With agrarian, you're using plows. Uh, people are developing terracing and uh, irrigation and uh, other things, of course, which are not strictly related to agriculture, like the wheel. 
uh, the sailing ship and these other things that allow uh, commerce, uh, trade, and things to move more quickly. All of that is eventually followed by industrial, which starts really in the 1700s with the invention of steam power. Uh, and then, of course, a few other societies are worth mentioning, the herding and fishing societies, um, which are sort of not off that, uh, not on that main column, but there are places where you can't really do much agriculture, where you have societies that basically herd animals, or areas along the coasts of seas and major rivers where there's just so many fish you don't, won't, don't bother with agriculture, or not much anyway. So those are other kinds of, of societies. But the agricultural revolution is the main backbone for human development. Uh, and as units of society get larger, of course, this means that towns and cities get larger as well. Um, I think uh, the estimate is that Ur, which was the largest city in Mesopotamia, had 25,000 people. Uh, Baghdad, under the caliphate in the year 800, was located maybe 100, 100 miles farther north, and Baghdad might have had half a million to a million people. Ancient Rome was also that size. There were cities in India and China were that size, and in, for that matter, even in Japan in the Middle Ages period, there were, you know, Tokyo was probably half a million people, uh, an immense, an immense uh, conglomeration of people. <clears throat> now, one of the problems you get when you get a lot of people living together is you get terrible um, divisions of, 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 of people into different classes and economic uh, situation. And this is a description from Lenski about agricultural societies, or ag I should say ag agrarian societies. Jesus lived in an agrarian society. Okay, agrarian societies were from maybe um, 500 BC up to, uh, well, just about the beginning of the agricultural revolution in most places. Um, and these societies, the ruling class took up to half the gross domestic product in the form of taxes. Uh, and so you can see the ruler as a little dot off the top of the uh, chart because the ruler had so much uh, accumulated uh, wealth and power that it, there's just nobody close to him. Uh, the ruler himself usually controls about one quarter of the society's uh, resources. Uh, then you have, of course, a governing class, which are uh, basically the aristocracy. Those are the sort of rulers locally. Um, the retainers are your, uh, your bureaucrats, basically. The priests are an interesting group because usually in agrarian societies, the priesthoods are a hereditary, not true, of course, in Christianity because of the of the celibacy rule, but uh, in, the, in other places they typically were hereditary, and the priests typically were associated with with temples or with monasteries of some sort, and these institutions often controlled ten or fifteen percent of the society's agricultural land, and that was where the priests got their income because they had farmers farming the land that they owned. The merchants, you can see them sort of as this long arc uh, right here. Some of them are quite poor. A few of them get very wealthy, you see. The governing class similarly can go from poor to wealthy. The retainers and priests can go from poor to wealthy. The middle group of people right here are your farmers. And some of them can do pretty well if they own their own land. Otherwise, they're dirt poor. Uh, artisans are right here. These are the people who uh, weave cloth and make pots and, and uh, make shoes. Uh, the blacksmiths, uh, the carpenters like Jesus' family. Uh, and they're not doing really well. No, none of them are wealthy. Some of them are pretty poor. What's particularly interesting down here are the unclean and degraded and the expendables. <clears throat> These two classes of people were people who basically they were basically kind of be constantly re replenished from people from the higher level because they didn't reproduce themselves. Maybe they've managed to have one child and um, uh, who might survive to adulthood. But generally speaking, the these two classes down the bottom were where the downward mobility of society went. We like to think of society having upward mobility, but these societies had downward mobility. The expendables were, were often slaves. Sometimes they were... Um, in, in Greco-Roman society, sometimes they would hire slaves, send them out to a salt mine in the middle of the desert and wouldn't bother to feed them and work literally work them to death because that was the cheapest way to um, mine the salt. So that was the kind of thing they did. Many um, ancient cities like Rome uh, had a large number of poor people who were basically fed by the wealth pe wealthy people providing them with bread. 
And then in turn, the poor people would riot when the wealthy people wanted them to. Uh, so this was a, one of the ways that the wealthy people would help to manipulate or control societies would, would be uh, having these uh, neighborhoods uh, that were sort of their neighborhoods that would, um, would uh, cause trouble if they needed it. So you can see the problem of for a man, the need for a manifestation of God under these kinds of societies with this extreme uh, situation of, of, of poverty. Uh, the average age of a person uh, in Greco-Roman Egypt, the longevity was 27 years. That excludes infant mortality because half of everybody died, half the babies died by age five. So in actual fact, longevity, the average person was five years. But if anyone survived five, their longevity was on the average 27. And longevity did not hit 40 anywhere in the world until the 19th, 19th century. It hit 40 in England, I think in 1830 or something like that. And that was the first time there was a recent society or modern society with longevity of 40. Of course, then it gets up to 50 and 60. And even in India today, it's close to 70. So uh, you can get, you know, with improvement and, and health, you can get much longer lives. I won't get into the, all the horrible details of what it was like to live in a, in, in a city uh, really up into the 19th century. You know, they didn't have uh, until the 19th century, there was no pressurized water, so you couldn't put fires out very well. Um, there was a spotty supply of, of water, which was not clean, and so you'd get horrible plagues. Uh, you'd get uh, you know, yellow fever outbreaks in Philadelphia in the early 19th century and all these. Malaria? You know, the United States had malaria in those days. Uh, all these things have now been wiped out because we've discovered the germ theory. But so life was very difficult. And uh, this was the kind of world that most of the world's religions developed in. Another thing to keep in mind as we develop as you know societies is our languages. Uh, many hunting and gathering societies, the vocabulary that's available in those languages only around a thousand or so words. They have relatively limited vocabulary, lots of words for various plants and things they encounter in nature, of course. <clears throat> Uh, when you get to biblical Hebrew, I think there's something like 10,000 words that have been recorded in the Old Testament. There probably were other words too, but not a huge number of others. When you get to Latin and Greek, you have hundreds of thousands of words, and in modern English, of course, several million words. Now, the more words you have in your language, uh, the more precisely you can talk about things, the more you can clarify arguments, um, the more you can uh, nuance uh, religious and theological positions, philosophical positions. <clears throat> I think, in my mind, one of the best examples of this is the account of Moses encountering the Pharaoh, meeting the Pharaoh. Uh, and he goes in and he, he tells the Pharaoh to let my people go. And the Pharaoh's priests are there as well. And they get into this sort of a debate about whose God is more powerful. And so Moses throws down his staff uh, on the ground and it becomes a snake. Uh, and so the priests of the Pharaoh throw down their staffs on the ground and they become snakes too. But Moses' snake eats their snakes. So I, I, this to me is a great example of a, a story that must have been told around a campfire for a few hundred years, um, uh, you know, or in, in somebody's house around the fire. Um, before there was a, a, any ability to write any of this, these stories down. It's a great folk tale. It's a very magical folk tale. But of course, there were no words to describe a manifestation of God that we have today. And so you describe a manifestation of God describing using stories, uh, magical stories, to talk about his, his authority and power. So this is the, the, the slow ch evolution and change that occurs. Um, for human beings over time as they develop more language and more ideas that they can use to express uh, religious concepts. <clears throat> Related to that is this idea of what's called the divine pyramid. I find this a very, very useful conception. I've, I've borrowed this particular picture from Bart Ehrman's introduction to the New Testament chapter two. And in this particular picture, he shows the Greco-Roman uh, divine pyramid. The Greco-Roman divine period starts out with Theos, or de Deus in Latin, on top, um, though you don't really have very much about the one God in either Greco Greek or Roman uh, religion. You basically have a lot 
uh, about the great god Zeus or Jupiter being the equivalent in Latin. And then, of course, they have their family, uh, Aphrodite and Ares and um, Hades and Hephaestus and uh, all these other um, members of the family. Of course, Zeus has got a wife uh, and, and children and all that. And, and for that matter, parents and grandparents or fathers and grandfathers, I should say. You do, however, hear about the one god, Theos, in the writing of some of the Greek philosophers. So they certainly had that idea. And then underneath that, you had all kinds of local gods, um, divine spirits and beings of various sorts, uh, immortal heroes. As, you know, Remember, Hercules is half divine and half human, um, divine beings, ghosts and spirits, all these kinds of things. And then down at the bottom, you have human beings. Uh, the equivalent of this in uh, ancient Israelite religion was, of course, you know, Yahweh or Jehovah on top. Uh, but then underneath that, you have the divine concourse that's mentioned several times uh, in the Old Testament. And you get the impression that maybe those other gods that their neighbors believed in, like like um, uh, Baal and such, may very well have been part of that uh, divine assembly. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the seraphim and the cherubim and various other uh, divine spirits. And then farther down that, or maybe at the same level, you have angels. I'm not sure how much angels were in the Old Testament, but certainly in the New Testament. And you, of course, also have uh, angels like Gabriel and such in Islam. So the divine pyramid has various levels to it in pretty much all the world's religions. Uh, in the, in the Baha'i faith, we can certainly talk about God and uh, underneath God, we can certainly talk about the manifestations of God. Uh, below, below that, we could talk about you know, the divine Plato and the various philosophers. There's always also angels. There's uh, spiritual figures of various sorts that existed in the world. Uh, and there's this various five levels that you he often will hear people talk about, Hahut and Lahut and Nasut and Malakut and, and, and uh, Jabarut different levels of, of uh, spiritual existence um, in, in the next world. So even we have a divine pyramid. With the Christians, you could create your own too. And of course, when you turn east to Buddhism, you've got the bodhisattvas. Um, you have at the very top, not the one God, but maybe you have nirvana. Maybe you have the Buddha nature. It's kind of hard to tell what goes on top. But again, you can, you can in pretty much every religion, um, create some sort of divine pyramid. And the main thing that progressive revelation does is I think is it refines these divine pyramids. It makes them uh, less um, superstitious, less mythical, and more uh, grounded in theology, grounded in, in revelation, I guess you could say. So that I think is kind of an interesting uh, idea that also we see changing over time uh, in human societies. Uh, something else I think is worth mentioning, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm getting to the whole issue of literacy, because literacy is an extremely important issue for um, progressive revelation as well. Uh, in, in the past, until very recently, of course, almost everybody was illiterate. <clears throat> literacy in the Greco-Roman world was, I think, 5 to 10 percent of all men, but pretty much close to 0 percent for women, because women almost never learned to read and write. I suspect at the time of Baha'u'llah uh, in the Middle East, it was about the same. Um, very, very low literacy levels. Though at least at the time of Baha'u'llah, you had paper, which made it much easier to write things down. Uh, if you go back to the time of Jesus, you know, papyrus was a very expensive thing to make because it's strips of, of, of reed that are glued together uh, in order to make a flexible surface to write on. Um, they've recovered... Um, in ancient Israel, uh, good evidence that uh, even by, by, I think, 500 BCE, there was a certain amount of literacy spreading in the population. And how do they know this? People wrote on broken pots, um, nice flat surface, little curved, uh, but the uh, writing on these ostraka, as they're called, uh, ostrakon, um, the, uh, the writing has been preserved in archaeological sites. So that's how we know about it. So because of the lack of literacy, and of course there was no printing press until the 1400s, so there was no there were no newspapers, no government records that were accessible, um, very very limited ability to read anything because it was so expensive to make copies of of things. 
So literacy was, was very poor. And under those circumstances, even histories were generally written based on oral accounts. And oral accounts mean storytelling was the main source of, of historical information. Now in, in the Greco-Roman world, um, the storytelling was very much based on describing uh, people as kind of archetypes of being certain characteristics. And then that characteristic was enduring all their lives. They were not, there was not a sense in Greco-Roman biography that people evolved um, over, over time. That's something that Augustine kind of invented in his confessions, I think. Um, but it was not common earlier than that. And so it was very common for Greco-Roman historians to invent speeches uh, in order to describe what the character believed or what the character was going to do. And if you ever have read Thucydides' uh, account of the, the uh, Peloponnesian Wars, I remember as 15 year old thinking, how do they know all these generals gave all these speeches? And the answer is they didn't, they just invented them. Uh, we see the same thing in the New Testament uh, in the book of Acts, where the speeches of Paul, the speeches of Peter basically sound the same because they were all written by the author of Acts who had no access to whatever Paul or Peter actually said um, because it would have all been an oral tradition for 40 years at that point. Uh, so you have this very, you know, limited ability to to write things down, and uh, most likely, actually, there's a good example of this in the in the um, it's the Gospel of John, I believe. You have a, a fairly long speech Jesus gives in chapters 17, 18, and 19, or something like that, and in the middle of it, um, he says, "And now we're leaving," and then he goes on and gives his speech again because it appears that these are two different speeches that were put together by the author. Uh, from various sources, um, and he just just stuck them together. And one of them happened to end with Jesus leaving the room, so they left Jesus leaving the room, and then have him continue the speech uh, by putting the next speech there. So this appears to be the the limited ability of people to write things down, and this obviously limits how well um, uh, a, a revelation can be transmitted. To get a little bit of a sense of sort of the timing of of the various manifestations of God. One of the problems we have is we can't even date them very well. Um, there's uh, the manifestation who started the Sabaean religion, who's not, we don't even know the person's name. It's just mentioned in the Baha'i writing. We don't know when he lived, probably before Abraham, but we're not sure. With Abraham, we have a 200 year window for when he lived. Um, and that's, uh, you know, uh, even that is probably uncertain. With Moses, it's more like a 50 year window. Uh, in terms of his birth and death dates. With Zoroaster, because there was no literacy in Iran until much later, uh, the, the dates for Zoroaster have a huge range of maybe as much as 900 years. The traditional date is more like 600, but more and more people think that he was probably much back in time than 600 BCE, because the Gathas, which are the, the hymns that are attributed to him, they're the oldest Zoroastrian scriptures, they're similar enough to the Sanskrit and the Rig Veda to suggest that um, there wasn't a long period of time uh, separating these two languages. The original, the, the, the language of the, the uh, Avesta, um, the, uh, well, the Gathas, which are the oldest hymns there, and the language of Sanskrit are probably separated by a few hundreds of years or a thousand years at the most, but not 2,000 years. So that's the problem of debating Zoroaster. We can't really be sure. With Krishna, frankly, I'm not even sure Krishna ever really existed. It's very hard to tell because the stories are so legendary. They're so mythical. Um, if he lit, lived, he probably lived somewhere around 800 BC or 700 BC, 500 BC, something like that. The, the conditions described in the Mahabharata are, are, are very hard to um, relate to a particular time period. With the Buddha, his birth date is somewhere within a 130 year period. Uh, we're not really quite sure when he lived because writing came into India starting around 500 BC, but it wasn't really widespread or used ext extensively until 300 BC. So uh, the, at the time of the Buddha, there was, it was essentially a pre-literate society. Nothing was being written down yet. And so it's very hard to date him. Uh, and there were no kings, there were, there were no dynasties where you could say he came in the rule of king such and such uh, because Northern India was full of little tiny city-states and each city-state had its own kings and they conquered each other and 
uh, and it was all pre-literate, so we don't even know the names of all those kings. So the best we can do is we can say, a, a Chinese person came down and visited India and reported what was going on in the year of uh, the third year of the reign of emperor such and such in China. And that's how we end up having to date a lot of things in India because of, of Chinese visitors. Um, with Jesus, his birth date is probably around four. It might be six BC. Um, his death is probably somewhere around 27. These are numbers that are probably plus or minus two, three, four years, something like that. And you can see as we get closer to the present how more exact these things get. With Muhammad, he might have been born in 569. He might have been born in 570. Those, that's the kind of range that you see. Almost everyone says 570 um, of the common era. Uh, his death was June of 622, but or 632, actually, 632. Um, but you know, it might have been the beginning of June or the end of June. Um, we don't have the exact date of his death, but we, at least we know the year, though I don't have it right here, <laughs> come to think of it. With the Bab and Baha'u'llah, of course, the, the dating is really quite precise. Um, in terms of their revelations, with Abraham and Moses, nothing was written down until about 950 BCE. So that gives you some idea of the, the, the time period. Uh, with the Buddha, the writing is at least two or 300 years after his death, and most of it is much, even later than that. With Jesus, the, the, uh, the uh, Gospels seem to have been written between 70 and 90 uh, AD. So if, if his death was around 30, that's 40 to 60 years later. The oldest documents in the uh, New Testament are the letters of Paul, and they date from about 20 years after the crucifixion. But unfortunately, Paul only quotes Jesus three times. So it's very hard to use Paul to find out very much about Jesus's life. Uh, he talks a lot about the risen Christ, but not much about the, the earthly Jesus. With Muhammad, of course, the Quran, some of it was actually written down while he was alive. Uh, some of it was oral tradition, but people memorized it. And it was written down in, in current form 20 or so years after the death of Muhammad. Um, and we actually have a, um, there's actually a Quran in Yemen that's been carbon dated that goes back very close to that time. Um, of course, there's always these error bars exactly when uh, something was uh, was written, when, when, it, when, it's car when the carbon dating actually occurred. Uh, you can't be quite sure, plus or minus like 10 or 15 years, but it actually goes back to the, about the time of Uthman and some of the later caliphs. So with that case, we have very good, reliable record of when uh, Muhammad provided his revelation. With the Bab and Baha'u'llah, of course, we have the original texts. We actually have the text that, uh, that where the, they dictated things and they were written down in many cases. Uh, if we don't have the original, we have a copy uh, that was done within sometimes days, sometimes months of, of the original text. So this means that the revelation is captured reliably. And that again shows you how much more valuable uh, we're closer today. We need to know exactly what the messenger of God said. So now we, we're at the point where we, we, we have that information. I should say a little something more about the connection between manifestations and civilization because uh, Baha'is often talk about how when a manifestation of God comes, it produces a civilization. It's actually a little more complicated than that. The manifestations of God come, sometimes the civilization's already there, and then they, ref, they have it to, to kind of refine it or re, revise it. Uh, other times they kind of found the civilization. That's sort of true of Moses and Muhammad, the enormous flowering of Israelite society uh, after um, Solomon and David, uh, and in the next 100 or two years after that, these are all you know, three or 400 years after Moses, uh, a, a great example of the impact of, of, a, of a manifestation of God. Uh, on a, a group of people. Similarly with Muhammad, um, by the year 800, you have an amazing civilization that stretches from Western China to Northern Spain. And uh, you have Baghdad at the center of it and translation of, of uh, texts into Arabic from Greek and um, Sanskrit and uh, Middle Persian and uh, various other languages. And all these different texts are being brought together and being studied, and there's a huge explosion of medical knowledge, technological uh, advancement that occurs uh, as a result of this mixing of ideas from these different civilizations. You know, they get, they, they get ideas from Aristotle and Plato to understand 
who uh, Muhammad in the, is and what the Quran is on the one hand. And on the other hand, they get the zero from India and they develop a much better system for keeping track of numbers for us. So the, this is a great example of how civilization can flourish as a result of the coming of the manifestation. On the other hand, 300 years after the coming of Jesus, the Roman Empire finally accepts him. It's Christianized and 100 years later, it pretty much collapses. So you don't always have material progress associated with a manifestation of God. Um, it's, it's sometimes a little difficult to be sure what the connection is. One thing that is quite clear is that between 200 and 800 BC, there was an incredible explosion uh, all across Eurasia from Greece to, to China of uh, urbanization, um, of building of empires, of bureaucracies, armies, uh, expansion of literacy, the writing of plays, the writing of histories, the writing of philosophy, the writing of theology, the writing of some theology and, and, and scriptures. And this is the time of Krishna, Buddha, Moses, and Zoroaster, more, more or less, the, the Israelite, uh, Israelite prophets, Confucius in China, and the Greek philosophers. So you have this uh, period of time, which is often called the Axial Age, where there was a, basically a, a revolution all the way across Eurasia in terms of um, social advancement and technological advancement. Uh, and again, this seems to be associated with various manifestations, but also with um, philosophers as well. And it's uh, really quite quite interesting how exactly it the philosophers and the the uh, manifestations relate to each other and how they relate to the advancement materially of society is hard to say, but we know that coinage is spreading at this time and coinage really helps a lot to create cities. Literacy is spreading at this time. Uh, trade, long distance trade is expanding. The Silk Road is being developed for the first time really towards the end of this period to get stuff in and out of China overland. Uh, so this is a time of huge technological progress and a time of a lot of, of manifestations and philosophers. Finally, I have one more thing I wanted to mention, and that's the, the basic, the, the two big challenges a manifestation of God faces. The first um, challenge they face is transmitting the revelation accurately to subsequent generations. And in a preliterate society, this is very difficult to do. Um, near as we can tell, storytelling is the thing that led uh, to the production of the Gospels. There was also uh, an interest in saving Jesus' sayings. And so we actually have a document that uh, no longer exists, but was used by Matthew and, and uh, Luke to write their Gospels called Q. And Q, near as we can tell, simply consisted of a list of sayings of Jesus. So we had people who were preserving his sayings. Um, because they thought they were important. Other people seem to have been preserving stories about his miracles, and th they perceived that to be the important thing about him. So you had these different people preserving different aspects of, of the stories, a story of Jesus, and then the gospel writers actually, starting in the year 70, are weaving all of these different strands together to try and produce what you might call a biography. So that seems to have been the, the, the way it was solved there. With Buddhism, uh, you have lists, you know, you have the eightfold, the, the eightfold path, you have the four noble truths, you have the two of this and the five of that and the seven of that and the six of this. Uh, Buddhism produced lots of numbered lists for people to be able to remember things in their preliterate society. With Zoroaster, the Gothas are hymns, uh, or, or you could at least call them uh, poems, so they, they had rhyme and meter, and that helps to transmit them. So different kinds of, of uh, techniques were used for preserving the revelation, uh, but it was very hard to preserve it accurately. We have no idea how much the teachings of Jesus uh, were lost and how much of it, what, what fraction of it survived. We know enough of it survived for uh, religion, a great religion to be built. Uh, only with the Quran do we finally have accurate transmission of the revelation. And then, of course, with the Bab and Baha'u'llah, the only accept written transmission. We don't even accept oral transmission uh, as being authoritative. That's would be what we call pilgrim's notes. So we no longer accept oral transmission at all as, as being an authoritative way, way for, for the, um, the teachings to be preserved. The second problem you have, uh, if you're a manifestation, 
is how to make sure that the revelation will be interpreted in the future accurately. And this again was unsolvable in the past. There was no way to create an institution to do it. Uh, with Jesus, there was no clear uh, successor, no clear authority. You know, you have the statement in Matthew, you know, Peter, thou art Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. But it's not clear that that gave Peter any particular authority. Um, it's not clear it made Peter his successor. Uh, when you read the book of Acts, it's not clear that Peter actually did anything. So we don't really have any clear evidence that Peter uh, asserted any kind of authority, particularly. The two letters in the New Testament attributed to him, first and second Peter, probably weren't even written by him, near as we can tell. Uh, they were probably written, in fact, uh, those are, well, no, I'm not, they're, they're not necessarily Pauline compositions. That, that would be true of James, but uh, but uh, they don't seem to be uh, attributed to a Pauline, uh, a Petrine tradition of any sort. With Muhammad, at least there was the oral appointment of Ali as his successor, but it was not accepted. And so Islam broke into a variety of different uh, competing sects uh, over the issue of, of, of authority. But then with Baha'u'llah, there was a clearly established succession of authority. So now with the Baha'i faith, we have both the issue of, of fidelity of transmission solved and the issue of fidelity of interpretation of the text uh, solved. And so this is a, quite an important development and a very important step for, the, for religion in the future. So that's basically um, what I have to offer. Um, and I'm pretty sure that's my last slide. Let me check to make sure. The only other thing I would mention, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll stop this. Uh, stop, stop showing my slides. The only other thing I would mention is I often have wondered what the next manifestation of God uh, will do. And imagine if we have um, virtual reality perfected uh, in a thousand years, which seems quite likely, it may very well be that we won't even find written transmission of the revelation to be adequate anymore, because we'll actually be able to witness it through virtual reality. Uh, and so that would be really quite a different kind of, uh, of standard for uh, receiving the revelation and, and, and experiencing the revelation of the manifestation of God. So that's basically the uh, ideas that I wanted to present. I hope that's, I hope it's coherent enough. It's maybe a little hard to follow um, the importance of, of, of revelation, but it gives you a good idea of how hum, human beings, how human societies have changed over thousands of years and how these produce ethical challenges that we continuously need new guidance for. And not, not even just new guidance, the guidance has to be preserved in such a way so that we trust it and we know how to interpret it. Otherwise, we'll weasel our way out of, of, of uh, moral injunctions by interpreting them in other ways, you know? And that's why the transmission and interpretation is so important. Back to you, Paymane. Thank you so much. Um, now we have some time for Q&A so people can put their questions in the chat. Um, the first one is, is Adam also recognized by Baha'is as a manifestation? Well, that's a good question. I suppose I would call Adam a mythic, mythic manifestation because who knows whether it was actually an individual named Adam. And if there was, when and doing what? I mean, I, I find, I, I, I tend to regard Adam as a kind of mythic manifestation, not a, not a literal historical individual. If you want to consider someone to have been a historical individual named Adam back in the past, we don't know anything about him. I and mean, he's not the same Adam as, as, as Genesis 1, you know, in a Garden of Eden wearing fig leaves. Uh, so <laughs> it, I guess you, you could decide what to do with that yourself, you know. You, I guess you could call him a manifestation, but whether he, who, who this historical Adam was, we don't know. Um, where do manifestations from indigenous peoples fit into the progressive revelation model slash law? That's a really good question. And I think the first thing to remember is that Abu Baha says that there are three kinds of prophets. This is published in this new little book. I don't have it here. 
um, um, Pearls of Wisdom that the, the publishing trust came out with a few years ago. And in there, there's a talk of Abu Baha's where he says there's three kinds of prophets. There's the great prophets, the manifestations of God. Then there are the prophets under them who are without, um, without constancy, like Isaiah and Ezekiel and, and Daniel and such. And then there are what he calls local prophets. So if, you, if you're trying to talk about the white buffalo calf woman, uh, or for that matter, the yellow emperor of China, or uh, Saleh and Hud, who are mentioned in the Quran and, and in the Igan, who are tribal figures. We don't know whether they were manifestations of God. We don't know whether they were, number two, the sort of dependent manifestations or prophets, or whether they were local prophets. We don't know. Uh, so we have these three different categories, and you could you could regard it in, in really in any in any of those ways, because I don't know if we have any way of, of, uh, of resolving it. How do you reconcile the Buddhist non-theistic tradition with the Judeo-Christian Islamic Baha'i theistic teachings? Exactly how non-theistic Buddhism is is itself an interesting question. Um, you know, the Buddha was supposedly once asked um, about, you know, how, I think the question was how long ago did the world come into existence or you know, will the world end? I don't remember the exact, exact question. And the Buddha said, you know, this is like the man walking in the woods who's shot by an arrow and he's laying on the ground bleeding and his friend runs up to him and says, quick, we've got to get you to a doctor. This is not quite the way it was phrased. And the man says, no, no, first, who shot me? Where was he? How far away was he? Why did he shoot me? And the guy's bleeding to death, you know. So the Buddha was very concerned with, with avoiding answering metaphysical questions. He wanted to focus on questions of of. of of, uh, of, of liberation, of achieving uh, nirvana, the breakthrough uh, of nirvana. Now, the breakthrough of nirvana is itself interesting. It's rather like the notion of union with God, uh, with Western uh, theistic mystics. Um, what is nirvana exactly? Uh, is it? It's not just a personal inner experience. It's also an experience of something else. Um, and what is that other thing that you're experiencing? Um, the Buddhists have various ways of understanding that. They, in Mahayana Buddhism, they talk about all things sharing a Buddha nature. Uh, and what's the Buddha nature that all things share? It's kind of like the kind of like the idea of the logos. It's the, the thing that creates the world, uh, even. So Buddhism has resources that are similar to all of this. And you've got to remember that the Buddha lived in India at the time when there were, there were all these competing models for the next world. There were people who believed in one God, people who believed in many gods. There were people who believed in the, 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 the basically the, the world is the God's body and it's the, the God is sort of the spirit or soul of, 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 of the world, physical world. Then there were, there were the people who were the skeptics who didn't believe there was anything like that at all. Uh, India actually had agnostics in those days. So the Buddha himself decided to try and stay out of the arguments, I think. Uh, and he wasn't concerned with focusing on the whole question of, of God. He was concerned with the question of personal transformation. And um, his notion of personal transformation isn't that different from what Baha'u'llah says in the hidden words, turn thy sight into thyself uh, where you'll find me mighty powerful and self-subsisting. You know, that's, that's, that's the, the insight of the Buddha right there. Um, can you explain how the BCE years work? Is it dated as before Christian era? I've also heard before common era. Well, yeah, BCE is basically uh, a secular, you know, before the common era replacement for before Christ. And common era is the replacement for AD, right? Anno Domini in the year of the Lord. Uh, so I'm just, uh, sometimes I switch back and forth. I use BC and BCE kind of interchangeably. They are the same year after all. Uh, and I'll use CE and AD sometimes interchangeably. Uh, and I even have a story about a rabbi who would use AD and BC. Um, it's a joke. I don't know how true it is. And the, a young student once asked him, why do you use, you know, BC and AD? And he said, well, BC, that just means before Christ. AD just means after that. So I guess you can interpret it different ways. <laughs>
How do you think the understanding of what is meant by establishing the kingdom of God on earth has evolved over the dispensations? Oh, I love that story, that question. Well, I'll give you a, I'll give you a very concrete example. If you read uh, Shoghi Effendi's description in the World Order of Baha'u'llah about the world we're trying to build where all the human res all the resources of the world will be uh, harnessed to civilization and life will be extended and and he makes a reference in another place about a, a, a swift form of communication will be developed that will be instant that will cover the whole globe now there's the kingdom of god on earth uh in in shoghi effendi's description now how do you compare that to and the and and the lion will lay down with the lamb you know I mean, that was like the best you could do 2,000 years ago. You know? uh, so I think the descriptions, which are filled with metaphors in the past to try and describe something that will happen in the future, um, were the best metaphors people could come up with at the time. Um, you know, uh, the, the law will, will descend from, uh, from Zion and will go out to the whole world. That, of course, refers to Jerusalem uh, originally. Um, to us, we would say it refers to Mount Carmel, but um, you know, the idea has to evolve as as our as our language improves and our metaphors become richer, uh, and uh, and we can become more concrete in our understanding of it too. I see someone commented about Abraham um, Adam being a great manifestation, and yes, from a theological point of view, he, I think you could call it a manifestation. Um, that's true, I think, in terms of it's the Adamic cycle, uh, the beginning of the Adamic cycle. Um, but I, I, that's a, I, that's all falls in the realm of, of theology to me. I don't think it falls in the realm of history, particularly because who knows whether he, who he was or where he lived or what he did or anything. You know, it's all uh, the, the, the statements and the writings, which gives us a theological basis for, for understanding uh, Adam. I think that this again shows you how, as we acquire more and more knowledge about the physical world, we can ask these kinds of questions. Uh, with the ancient Greeks, you didn't yet even have the scientific method. You know, uh, Aristotle was perfectly content to say that larger objects fall faster than smaller objects. There was no notion that gravity pulls them all at the same speed and that there's air resistance that causes the differing time they land on the ground. And it took Galileo to drop things off the Leaning Tower of Pisa, with cannonballs big and small, showing they land on the ground at the same time to, to show there was such a thing as, as a prediction of predictable thing called gravity. If he actually did that, I don't know if that's a real, whether it's an apocryphal story about Galileo or not. How has the idea of God evolved through history? Well, that, yeah, that gets back to the divine pyramid thing. Um, uh, the divine pyramid really shows you this idea that I mean, is the is the one God on top the most important thing, uh, or are the the family of gods right next to right on next level down the most important thing? You know, uh, different different peoples have come to different conclusions, and, and and as I said, it the divine pyramid for Buddhism to some extent puts Nirvana on top, um, and is Nirvana an experience of an ultimate force out there? Um, I guess that's the best you could say. You can't pray to Nirvana, um, but then Christians usually pray to Jesus and not to the Father. Um, you know, that's a similar kind of thing. Um, uh, you may pray to different levels of of uh, divine uh, energy. You might pray to the Virgin Mary, for example, if you're a Catholic, and presumably she will run over and tap her son on the shoulder and say, I just got this message from somebody. Uh, I, I like to say that, um, you know, that the, there's a bodhisattva called Quan Yin in China. It's a female, female bodhisattva figure that people can pray to. And I've often thought if people pray to Quan Yin, God sitting up in the heavens, hears, hears this prayer and says, well, I guess today I'm Quan Yin. You know? I think I think God has a great capacity of making lemonade out of lemons, and we humans generate a lot of lemons, so he has to make a lot of lemonade. What is the advancement in the idea of God that the Baha'i faith offers? Advancement in the idea of God. 
Well, what we have with the Baha'i faith is we have a, a, a numerous quotations, statements from Baha'u'llah and Abu Baha that clarify ideas that floated around in Islam about God. Um, so, for example, uh, there were a certain number of, of Muslims who tended to um, be pantheistic. They tended to put God as part of the, the world, a part of the universe. And Baha'u'llah has said that that's not the best way of understanding God. Uh, you separate God and creation. Creator and creation are, are two different things. So the Baha'i writings have really nuanced a lot of the, the ideas that already existed in, in Islam and, and Christianity. I think one of the most interesting advancements there really is the notion of the manifestation and the relationship between the manifestation and, and, and the divine essence. Um, we have actually this whole issue coming up in in the, the Gospel of jo of John. You know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So you have right there the the Greek notion of the logos, the Word, uh, becoming part of Christian scripture, and describing the relationship between Jesus and the Father. Uh, then, of course, there's no Holy Spirit in in the Gospel of John, so the Christians then add the Holy Spirit. Because in um, in um, Matthew and in the book of Acts, it says to go forth and uh, baptize the nations in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So a baptismal formula becomes a map of God. It probably was not intended to be a map of God, but that becomes the, the reconciliation for Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So you have these different efforts trying to understand understand the divine, and they come up with different solutions. And they argue about them. Of course, Christians killed each other over the whole issue of the nature of the Trinity. Uh, and and Baha'u'llah has, has answered a lot of these questions and clarified uh, the meanings. I'm not a theologian, so I probably can't give too much more of an answer than that. But that gives you some idea of the, how the faith has helped. In the Bible, it is said that both Abraham and Elijah had direct connections to God. I think the former was said to wrestle with God. Could you comment, please? It wasn't Abraham who wrestled with God. It was, um, uh, um, what's his name? Israel. Because the word Israel means one who wrestles with God, if I remember right. Uh, Harold might remember this better than me, actually. But um, yeah, you have these stories about wrestling with God. Uh, and these presumably are metaphorical types of stories. Uh, you know, obviously God doesn't have a body, so you can't exactly wrestle with him. And then gets into the whole question whether you'd use a full Nelson or a half Nelson on him too, I suppose, uh, if you know anything about wrestling. But, uh, you know, these are these are stories, and and um, they're great stories. They're, they're stories that, that tell us something about human beings and their their struggles with understanding God and and and, and obeying God. How does Sybil of the Greco-Roman tradition fit in the Divine Pyramid? Well, I don't remember exactly who Sybil is, so I would have to look at that closely and see how it fit into the Greco-Roman version of all this. But I, I think she's like a prophetess, in which case she would be some sort of figure farther down, maybe semi-divine or something. Um, but I don't remember exactly what Sybil's role was uh, in Roman. That was she was Roman, if I remember right. People for such interesting questions, and uh, I think there's so much more we can say about progressive revelation as it relates to history. And so I hope we can encourage more people to do historical research so they can kind of fill fill in those gaps and help us come to better understandings about it. Well, thank you so much. This was a really informative talk, um, and I'm sure people will listen and share afterwards as well. So thank you. So our speaker next week will be um, Dariush Lamy, and his topic will be three plus one steps to effective prayer. So again, these talks are every Saturday at noon Eastern time, and I've put the link to our mailing list and YouTube channel in the chat. Thank you, everyone. See you next week. Bye.